not too often that I find a homebrewing podcast that has a different approach to homebrewing. When I first checked out Pop Culture Brews, I thought it was a very cool approach to blending movies and music as inspiration to brewing beer. Today, we're talking to Andrew Sanders about his podcast and all the beers that have been inspired by his show today on Homebrewing DIY. Keeping a clean brewery is the key to making great beer that doesn't get contaminated. Do you use a glass or plastic carboy for your fermentation? Did you know that getting your carboy clean can be tough, especially removing the cruising ring? Even with traditional carboy cleaning tools, it can take a lot of time and not get your carboy completely clean. Well, today there's a new tool that can easily clean your carboy and do it fast. And that tool is called a scrubber ducky. Scrubber duckies are a new magnetic carboy cleaner that are easy to use and get the cleaning results required in brewing. Drop a magnetic scrubber into your carboy and be able to scrub away all of the grime in that hard to clean cruising. They are no match for scrubber duckies and you can get yours today at scrubberduckies.com. Once again, head over to scrubberduckies.com. Building recipes and taking good notes are two of the key fundamentals of making great beer. This is one of the first things that you learn when becoming a new brewer. I started taking notes on a sheet from my extract kit and then quickly moved to brewing software. I've tried many different types of brewing software and then I found Brewfather. This is the one piece of software that you need for recipes and very detailed brew day notes as well as fermentation notes. Brewfather also integrates with some of the topics that we discuss on the show like the till hydrometer, the ice spindle, and ferment track. You need no other piece of software than Brewfather. One of the best parts of Brewfather is that you can try it for free. All you need to do is head to our website, homebrewingdiy.beer, and click on the Brewfather banner to sign up for free today. Once again, that's homebrewingdiy.beer, and sign up for Brewfather today. Have you ever wanted to make a podcast? Do you have a subject you want to discuss with listeners? Do you even know where to start? Well, if you want to make a podcast and you want to get started now, I could not recommend Anchor enough. Anchor is the easiest way to make a podcast. Anchor gives you everything you need in one place for free, which you can use right from your phone or computer. Creation tools allow you to record and edit your podcast so it sounds great. They'll distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard everywhere. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and many more. And you can easily make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. Hey, look, I shopped around for a place to post my podcast, and Anchor was the easiest, most streamlined experience you could ask for. So if you're looking for a place for your new podcast, download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Once again, download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. And welcome back to Homebrewing DIY, the show that takes on the do-it-yourself aspect of homebrewing. Gadgets, contraptions, and parts, this podcast covers it all. Today on the show, we're talking to Andrew Sanders about his podcast, Pop Culture Brews, and the beer that he has made and how they were inspired. First, I'd like to thank all of our patrons over at patreon.com forward slash homebrewing DIY. Your monthly support keeps this show going strong. Right now, we have a couple of supporter specials going on. The first 20 people to give at the $1 level will gain access to our early ad-free RSS feed. After that, you'll need to give at the $5 level to get access to that feed. We also have a special going on for the $5 level that you get a gift from our sponsor, Scrubber Duckies, and that's a $25 value. So head over to patreon.com forward slash homebrewing DIY and give today. 
Another way that you can support the show is to head over and review us on Apple Podcasts or Podchaser.com. Your reviews will help other homebrewers find the show. The last way to support the show is to head over to homebrewingdiy.beer and use our sponsor links. Your prices stay the same, but when you buy from our sponsors, they know we sent you and they support the show. So head over to homebrewingdiy.beer today. You can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Just look for the handle at homebrewingdiy. I'm currently in the process of brewing a 10-gallon batch of Irish Red Ale, and I have a disaster on my hands. After I made the beer, I put it in my fermentation chamber, and the heater wasn't working. So I heat my fermentation chamber with a 100-watt light bulb in an unused paint can, and it's worked great for years. Well, the light bulb had burned out, and I went to go get a new one, and I couldn't actually find a 100-watt light bulb. All I could find were LED bulbs, but they did have a heat lamp at the store. So I was like, hey, I'll give it a shot. At least it's going to throw off some heat. Well, it's a 250-watt bulb, and when I added it to my fermentation chamber, it was way too hot, and it melted a hole in the plastic of my fermentation chamber. I'm just lucky I didn't burn my house down. Needless to say, my fermentation chamber smells like burnt plastic, and I think I'm going to have to go and replace it. Well, when I do replace it, I think I'm just going to do a chest freezer, and I'm going to use the same temperature controllers. But uh, yeah, you know, all in all, I kind of feel dumb. Oh well, on to the next batch. And now that we're done with announcements, let's jump into our talk with Andrew Sanders and talk about pop culture brews today on Homebrewing DIY. I'd like to welcome Andrew Sanders to the show. He's he's the host of the Pop Cu- Pop Culture Brews podcast. Uh, welcome, Andrew. Hi, thanks for having me. Apparently, I I don't know how to say the word pop culture, so the, it, let's my, just get my that out of the way. Screws it up because for me, it's pop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's it, it's true. I'm glad to have you on the show. Let's get started on talking about the podcast that you have, which is kind of a unique take on uh, on brewing podcasts. In that, uh, you guys uh, kind of take a a piece of pop culture analyze that and then brew a beer inspired based on that pop culture right yeah no that that that's exactly it we take books movies music anything that really i mean a lot of it i'm sure stems from our childhood in one way or another but things that kind of we grew up with and so yeah during the episode we just kind of have a free-flowing conversation between the two of us what that means to us sometimes it's something that the other one of us isn't familiar with I think our next episode that comes out is uh, Weekend at Bernie's, which I had never seen. And my friend Tyler was like, we have to do Weekend at Bernie's. And then other times it's stuff that we are both really familiar with. And yeah, as you say, at the end of each episode, we kind of reveal to you the beer that we were um, inspired to brew by it. We give out the the recipe and we kind of tell the story of why that beer, what, what about the film or book or whatever inspired that beer. Okay, so when you pick some of the topics that you do, is it is it kind of something like you pick every week? Does uh, Tyler pick every week? How, how, how do you guys kind of figure out what you guys are going to talk about? Generally on a brew day, we talk about stuff we like. <laughs> Um, so when, when I started the podcast, it was a one man podcast. It was just me and it really was just things I like. The first episode being ready player one is a book and movie I really enjoy or hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy, which is my favorite book of all time. And my friend Tyler is a huge Harry Potter fan. And I knew that I would want to do a Harry Potter bit, but I don't know enough about Harry Potter to be fully kind of comfortable talking about it and so I had him come on for an episode which was way more fun to record having someone else there and so that's how the show kind of progressed and really it's just us kind of talking about on a uh, on a brew day like we have this idea or the other night we were kind of jumping between ideas of different beers we could brew and all of a sudden, it was like I should totally do an eleven percent stout for Spinal Tap. And it, it, are you you guys brewing a beer every week? What's the cadence of that? We 
Brew. So we actually recorded a bunch of episodes um, before we started releasing them. But we've got Dracula coming out in a couple of weeks that I brewed around Christmas time. So we joke about how um, Dracula is the ultimate Christmas beer. But generally we brew once, maybe twice a month um, together um, or separately. So we generally have about two beers a month we can talk about. Okay. The show comes out, what, every two weeks? Yeah, it comes out every two weeks on a Tuesday. I don't know why okay. I chose Tuesday. It just seemed like a good idea at the time. Yep. Uh, that's kind of how I pick Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> days beginning like, with this... tea. They're good days to talk and drink about beer. Exactly. Exactly. Well, I, I think any day that has the word day in it is a good day to have it's a beer. It's a beautiful thing. Beer is just a beautiful thing. How how do you like approach what you're actually going to make and in recipe formulation? What's what's the actual approach there? A lot of it is I mean, I started home brewing six years ago. And so I have a lot of books that have recipes which I started, you know, that's how I learned to brew. Now it's just kind of I'm one of the most um, kind of technically inefficient brewers you'll ever meet. One of my friends is one of the most wonderful brewers. My friend Matt uses a lot of software and um, creates these perfectly technically wonderful beers. My approach is kind of just stealing from every source that I can find. So um, when I wanted to do the Jelly Donut, uh, which was the Ready Player One beer, it's a vanilla and raspberry biscuit ale. So I just started reading about um, kind of what makes a biscuit ale, what malts will do what. And there are beers that I make that have been very lightly hopped, which, you know, was something I wanted from that. So I'm just stealing from myself and, and other people to come up with something original. Okay. Well, I, I think a jelly donut uh, biscuit ale sounds very, very unique to me in uh, in approach, right? How do you make a jelly donut biscuit ale? What, what, what's in that? I can't remember the base malts, but essentially, it's essentially a cream ale, I want to say, with um, a healthy dose of biscuit malt in it to get that roasty flavor. Uh, the hops I'm using... Uh, very low in bitterness, um, kind of very subtle aroma. And then the way we did it was, and it took two or three tries to get it right, was we used flavored vanilla and raspberry um, flavoring. And, and the raspberry flavoring was like extract. Did you use like pure fruit? What would you end oh, up? Oh no! Doing? It, it it was it was one of those small bottles of syrups you can buy at any local brew shop. Okay, so it's like the it's the like concentrate syrup, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. I use that. I would love to use fresh vanilla a lot more, um, but um, vanilla is so expensive these days that. Um, yeah, I, I can't afford that. It's kind of funny, you know, you you talk about the price of vanilla and how it's kind of ramped up over the last few years. And uh, it, it really has. Using vanilla extract is kind of my gauge, right? I used to buy like the, the large uh, jar of it from Costco and it used to be about, I would say about 12 or $13, which was mm -hmm. still pretty expensive when you think about it. it's just a jar of vanilla extract, right? Yeah. It's now $30, right? <laughs> it's tripled in price in like a year. No, and, it, it's uh, crazy. And so those those little bottles of syrup, the one thing I always urge caution with, because uh, they always say, hey, throw an ounce in for every five gallons. With vanilla, that goes a long way. Yeah. It does go a long way. Yeah. Yeah. And then when when you uh when when you guys are are analyzing kind of uh you know let, let's say you guys pick a movie, right? And you watch a movie and uh let's use a weekend at Bernie's for example. Um also um I do feel it's kind of a bit of sacrilege that you've never seen Weekend at Bernie's. Uh, <laughs> Believe me when <laughs> when we sat down to watch and we talk about it in the episode, I was blown away. I mean, how that isn't on the AFI top 100, I, I will never know. <laughs> it, it's it's such a bad, good movie. <laughs> Would we use the word bad? Huh? Would we use the word bad? 
you know, it, it, it's a classic, but like, it's kind of one of those things where like you, you kind of put it in its time. Right. I think it came out like late eighties, early nineties. Right. And, uh, I think it was you, you, 87 if I remember correctly. Yeah. The 87, 88 seems about right. It comes out and there's just humor in that movie that you would never get away with today. Oh God. And then on top of that, and then on top of that, it's, it's kind of, uh, there's a, there's definitely, if we were to take that movie and actually make it for today and that idea hadn't been done before, Mm -hmm. they would do it completely differently just because the way people approach movies today is so different. And uh, it's, it's almost like a time capsule of the, of the way that uh, things were at that time and how people approached comedy. Right. Yeah. And there's, there's a weird innocence about it, even though that's cocaine and, and, you know, other unsavory things in there it it doesn't feel as as far as it might be taken now yeah exactly like a great example would be in the 80s uh when you you, when you talk about things like drug use and 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 those types of things you know now we have entire movies that are just like all about smoking weed and how cool it is yeah and in the late 80s to do that was super taboo and so uh yet um, to have a uh, jokes that are super metal and chauvinist, we're totally okay. So it's just kind of like one of those things where it's like it's 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 a it's an image of its time. <laughs> I had a had a guy in my office today who was uh, going to see Blazing Saddles for the first time. In, oh my in, god, he's not ready. He, oh, he's not ready. <laughs> and he, he and, and 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 the thing is, is like he's uh you know I I think he's like twenty three, right? And he's like, yeah, I'm going to a friend's house. We've never seen. He wants me to see Blazing Saddles. I've never seen it before. And I'm like, man, that's a, that is a movie full of jokes that you could never tell today. <laughs> no, and I would love to cover Blazing Saddles on the show. I just don't know that two white guys who live in Denver can really do it justice. <laughs> <laughs> I, I kind of agree with that, right? So it's 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 kind of one of those things where it's that kind of movie, yeah. but. Uh, I was like, be ready. It's a great movie. You're going to love it. <laughs> we were we were so lucky. My wife and I got to see Mel Brooks uh, when he came to town doing a tour of the movie and talks. And one of my best days out ever. Ah, uh, uh, Mel Brooks, uh, he has so many classics that it's like uh, you can't really even begin because no. everything he touched was like gold, right? And pure comedy gold. One of my favorites, uh, just the other day, I watched Spaceballs. And, I uh, love Spaceballs. Oh, man, Spaceballs is so good. We, and, we uh, are trying to work out a young Frankenstein beer. Yeah. But you uh, know, we, uh, we, haven't, we haven't hit on like what that winningness beer is yet. Um, well, you have to, like, it's got to be like a Russian Imperial Stout. <laughs> I know, but then I feel like I'm cheating with the 11% spinal tap. Like, <laughs> hey, kids, have another really strong stout. <laughs> totally. But on the other side of it is is that you have uh, uh, it, it's kind of, or a Baltic porter, right? It's got to be that uh, Eastern European uh, style. <laughs> that would be fun. I like that idea. All right. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm stealing that. I'm texting Tyler I- right now. <laughs> i i love a good baltic porter and uh it's been a long time since i've actually had one i well i wouldn't say that long of a time you definitely run across one when you're at like uh gabf or something like that you you definitely run across one but it's not a beer like you walk into a, a liquor store specifically here in denver you walk in and you've got shelf after shelf of all these amazing beers oh it's and, incredible uh, Bal- yeah, and Baltic Porter tends to be like that one that's kind of hidden away. Like yeah. it's not like something people make. Um, well, and yeah. and I I I I've talked about this with with Tyler a little bit. Like I'm I'm such an IPA guy, which is such a cliche, and so I'm trying to throw myself more into the realm of dark beers because I grew up drinking Guinness, and so everyone just assumed that I really love dark beers and stouts, and Guinness is Guinness. Guinness is not a stout. Nope. And so I'm trying to educate myself further in dark beers again. Yeah, uh, my my favorite joke about Guinness is uh Guinness is like diet beer. It actually has I think 10 more calories than a uh um what, what's the, the a Michelob Ultra? Yeah. Um yeah, it's it's super light, very low alcohol 
And uh, because it's on nitro is the reason why it has that much body. And you feel like you're just drinking this really heavy beer. It's really not. It's a, no, it's a it's, very, it's, very it's, light I mean, beer. that was one of the reasons I put in a nitro system was so I can try my hand at it one day. Hey, Guinness is like almost diet beer. Not that Guinness sucks. It's a great beer. Oh, no, um, it's, it's, it's fantastic. And uh, yeah, I can only, I can't have it in the house though. I can, I can only drink it when it's on tap. Yeah, I, I I completely agree. It has to be on on draft. Uh, you have to. It's just kind of got like Guinness has got a thing, right? You have yeah. to have it in the Guinness class. I don't know. That's just that's stolen the thing for many me. of those from a pub. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you have. Everybody assumes that uh, you know you you, you love a, a hand drawn beer, right? And, oh, absolutely. Uh, and, and and so for me, it's like that is you know other than Hogshead Brewery here in uh, in Colorado. That's pretty much where you can get one of those here, right? That, and, I mean, you've got Pines Pub downtown, and they generally have um, one IPA yeah. um, on car. And it's usually a hogshead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do love hogshead. I haven't gone for a while, but um, I do appreciate that they have proper proper um, beer machines. Yeah, totally. It, well, it's funny. is uh, I'm in Arvada, um, and uh, we have a, 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 beer, uh, a, a beer bar, and... Uh, a beer hall, I guess, is what it is. Yeah. And uh, they actually have two hand-drawn um, taps there, and uh, both of them are always Hogshead. So it's yeah. kind of like, yeah, yeah, you can get them here, but when you get them, it's the same brewery because that's really the brewery here that does it. And, yeah. uh, and what I find amazing about it, so I have this thing about British ales in American, um, in, in American bars and, and tap houses and breweries, is... My personal opinion is Hogshead is really one of the few breweries to get it right. And I think partly what it is, is they're either using the exact right grain and port it over, but also I feel like a lot of other breweries, when they're using British hops, they're hopping it in the manner of an American ale. And so you're getting a lot of earthiness and a lot of um, just kind of that... I. I, I can't even describe it politely, um, but you're getting a lot of hot flavor in there that really doesn't exist in a uh, proper British pint. Yeah. the For me, like, uh, and, and I'll use Hogs, Hog, Hogshead as an example, their beers tend to have a, it, it's, it's almost like it, it, it's bitter, but yeah. it's not... They, they, they're not trying to pull out citrus out of it, right? They're no, just trying and, to... And, and the bitterness there isn't... It's also not a competition. Because yes. when you have like a bitter American IPA, which I'm I'm all about, I love them, but I always describe it as like giving your tongue a kicking. It doesn't work with um, British ales that well. Well, and, but you also have to realize that uh, British ales tend to have that balance of malt with, with hop and... Uh, and they you they want you to taste the malt right yeah. and 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 even the yeast that they use um tend to bring out that and even in if we if we bring in an american style we talk about the new england ipa they're using british um l yeast for mm-hmm. those styles of beer but you also have to realize they're bringing in they're they're taking a lot of the gypsum out and they're bringing in that calcium chloride to bring out the juiciness, in, at least in the water profile, yeah. which is a very non-British water profile, right? Oh, absolutely. And so, so it's kind of like, even though they might bring something from Britain in there and make it as part of the mix, it's still truly an American way because the Americans have now kind of said, hey, what we're trying to do is really incent- accentuate a, an aspect of the hops that we want that is this like juicy in your face hop aroma that is not as bitter. It's kind of a unique thing, obviously, to those East Coast styles, mm-hmm. but it is something where you have uh, like, yeah, you're, they're using an English yeast, but if you were to take that same yeast um, put it into a water profile that's more gypsum based, um, which is actually probably more closely related to a British style of uh, of a water profile. You're gonna get a lot more of the malt character to come out, a mm-hmm. little, a, a lot more astringency when it comes to the hopping because it's gonna bring out more of the bitterness. Um, even if you put it in later in the additions, though, uh, I think that at least the British beers that I've made and the British beers that I've had. 
um, you know, they usually have a good charge at 60 minutes, right? And mm-hmm. you have entire beers in the New England style that are like, hey, there's n- no bittering hops. It's all late edition. Yeah, and, and the other thing to remember as well is um, <clears throat> is British beers also tend to be very low in alcohol as well. Yes. I mean, if you, if you um, go above 4%, they described that as um, what was I was talking to a friend. His wife had just gone to a beer festival in uh, Britain, and she was reading like the descriptions of beer, and it was one of them was like, and this comes in at an impressive and walloping four percent, and that to us over here now is non-alcoholic, which probably says more about us than we should probably admit to. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> totally, yeah, anything over four percent, and uh, that that's a big beer over there. Yeah. Well, so uh, kind of a bit of background on me. I'm actually from Utah, the land of uh, 3-2 beer. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, I come from a state um, until I moved to Colorado where every draft beer on tap had to be 4% or less. And so as a state, they got really creative in being able to make uh, those session type beers that came in at 4% or less, but still you know, they tried to make it, they would do session IPAs and try to make them actually be good beers. And they Mm -hmm. did a really good job of it. They've now changed since changed the law. And you can now at least get a beer that is above 4% in Utah, kind of crazy. If you have a law that kind of holds you into that parameter, people can get really creative and make great beers. I actually still like low alcohol beers because I like to have more than one. (laughs) <laughs> well no and, so, and, and what people forget is it's actually kind of difficult to make a really flavorful low alcohol beer sometimes yeah and not have water it because it'll it can taste watery right it can and, yeah and, yeah. and yeah. one of the things that i i noticed when last time i was over in england um and and having um cast pulled pints was not saying the body is thin but the body of them was much thinner than what you get over here yeah but i would like to also say that they're not flat or are they warm yes they're they're not i I have to defend (laughs) them on that (laughs) (laughs) yet uh you know we we all give ourselves preconceived notions and then all of a sudden that's the way it is because we've never really experienced it (laughs) (laughs) so uh Let's talk a bit about your uh, brewing setup and, and sure. kind of how you do your brew day. I, I personally am a brew in a bag, single vessel guy. Mm-hmm. Um, what, why don't you walk me a bit through uh, what your brew setup looks like? So I, I, I used to do brew in a bag. Um, but really, I, I have a very simple setup. It's uh, a 10-gallon pot. I have a burner, which I thankfully finally updated to a 200,000 BTU burner. I was on a 55,000 before, so my brew day has got cut in half. Um, I have a 10 gallon mash tun, um, with a filter in it and, uh, I have a five gallon pot to do my sparge water. So it really is a very, I have a very manual day of brewing, um, in that I heat up the, um, the, the water to mash the grains. Uh, and then I throw that in the mash tun. I always do 90 minute mashes. I just got given that advice by a brewer once, so it just kind of stuck with me. Um, but when I got 20 minutes of that left, I'm heating up the other five gallons of water so I can do a batch sparge. Uh, and so I let that sit on the water. Um, I let that sit on the grain for 10 minutes and then I add it and I just start boiling. What, what, what would you say is manual of that day? I'm doing a lot of lifting. My friend I was talking about earlier, um, has his home system with all the pumps and everything. And I'm literally lugging um, five to eight gallons of liquid from my burner onto my bench um, to, uh, you know, put one thing into one pot to another pot. So it, it gets pretty manual at certain points during the day. And then you batch sparge, goes right into the boil kettle, then it's hop additions, and then uh, into the fermenter, right? That's exactly it. You you doing any type of fermentation control, or are we uh, 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 throwing it in the in a dark corner in the basement? Where, where are you at on that? <laughs> so my basement holds at about sixty eight, so it's kind of um, really great for ale yeast. So I do a lot of ales. I do have on my fridges. I have two fridges that I use as kegerators, but if I'm lagering, then I have full temperature controls on those. Okay. And how many loggers a year are you making right now? 
I so I've only actually ever made two or three lagers because what happens is I have as I say I've got two kegerators and they're normally full so I don't have the room to uh lager normally yeah sounds like uh same, sim- similar issues I have uh except for right now my entire kegerator is empty the oh, super bowl blew through that. my I'm I'm about to I have 20 gallons in the fermenter right now Ooh, but what are you, uh, what are you brewing uh, so randomly my boss, uh, came over and had a brew day and I did 10 gallons and he did 10 gallons and I did 10 gallons of red ale, uh, Ooh. and, uh, Irish red. Mm-hmm. And then he did a 10 gallon, just, uh, what I have laying around IPA. I, I, we all make one of those every year. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so what we've done is, uh, then we just left it all brewing here at my house. I can actually put 10 gallons into, into my fermentation chamber. Then I have, also a basement that holds steady at around 65. I would say I've got about three or four more days in the fermenter, and then we're going to throw them in the kegs and get and get my kegerator filled back up. But it was, uh, yeah, the Super Bowl blew through all my beer. I had three <laughs> kegs, and they're all gone. So We were at um, we were at Tyler's for the Super Bowl, and I know I um, helped put a dent in his uh, grapefruit blonde that he had. <laughs> it was It was phenomenal what's the what's the kind of future of your show and where where are things going how 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 do you think things are going for having such a as you said um unique podcast i would say niche <laughs> or so bloody specific you know i think it's good i mean i'm i'm very proud of the episodes that i started out with because it was a great way for me to um remember how to do sound editing from a previous life of mine um, and play with music and things like that. But, you know, since Tyler's been joining the show, we've been brewing together a lot, which has been awesome. And, uh, yeah, we're, we're slowly increasing our listenership, which is a nice thing as well. I also awesome. really you... enjoy the kind of podcast community on Twitter. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and and do, you, do you get a lot of, you know, feedback from your listeners that are kind of, you know, uh, talking about, like, some of the subjects that you talk about? Fortunately not. <laughs> no, I put a joke up on um, Twitter a few weeks ago about, hey, Tyler, maybe we'd get more listeners if we uh, were a true crime podcast that brewed beer inspired by true crime. Um, because every <laughs> you totally podcast would. out there is a true crime podcast, which, by the way, a lot of them are fantastic. And, um, yeah, we actually had a guy reach out to us going, no, I just discovered you. <laughs> I was like, I'm sorry. It was clearly a joke. How messed up would I have to be to be like brewing a beer inspired by real life murders? It, it totally, totally. <laughs> and, 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 and to be honest, uh, it's kind of like, uh, the true ki- crime has become such a thing that when you go to, uh, like Apple podcasts, there's yeah. actually like a true crime section, right? It's its own category now. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and, uh, Thank God my wife hasn't discovered True Crime podcast yet because if she did that, like that's literally all she watches on TV. So she would just totally move that to podcasts easily. Personally, I, I listen to a lot of homebrewing podcasts. I listen to uh, randomly um, a lot of like uh, um, skeptic podcasts. Um, okay. I, I'm re- yeah, I'm really into like the skeptic movement. That's kind of uh, the, my actual favorite genre is to talk about uh, junk science. I don't well, know why. Yeah. <laughs> but uh but yeah. on the other hand of that is uh, uh you know one of the i think the the coolest parts of uh having a podcast on my side has been the feedback i get from the homebrewing community and mm-hmm. uh, them talking about uh you know like my mine is also kind of a a niche in that uh, yeah we talk about homebrewing but i also focus a lot on uh, equipment uh yeah. lately haven't so much but we'll, we'll definitely be getting back to that and so uh but the idea is that uh um when we when we we focus on that, I get great emails of people's projects, right? And yeah. uh, it, it, like last week, um, I had a, a guy sh- uh, email me a picture of the the grain um, mill that he had built from like parts that he had uh, uh, had around his house and actually like made his own mill. It, it's super cool. That's and, really uh, cool. I, I mean, I've been on your website and I've seen some of the pictures of the guests you've had on. Um, cause I, I mean, we spoke about this on Twitter. I discovered you when you did the, uh, you were talking to the two British gents who basically use a tea on for yep. uh, brewing, which I just thought was the funniest thing in the world. 
Oh, the cooksies. Um, they they think it's the funniest thing in the world too. Yeah, That's no, and I, I I love them for it. And um, what was great is that I, I I'm I'm once again I'm very inept. Um, I don't understand liters and um, kilograms. I'm actually more used to American uh, measurements. And so when they're like, "Yeah, you get your twenty three liters," I'm like, "How much is that?" <laughs> you are the only British guy I know that actually doesn't like the uh, leaders. <laughs> oh, it's not that I <laughs> don't like it. System. It's just I never paid. I didn't brew in England, so I never paid attention to that stuff. The conversions aren't that like 23 liters is about five gallons. So yeah. it's like pretty close, but it's just, it's, it's hilarious how like, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm the one here that's like, I wish we were all on the metric system. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, in, in many ways it makes sense, but then I'm just kind of like, eh, I learned in gallons. I just kind of want to keep it that way. My pot yeah, has well, gallons. Ha- when, once you figure out like your, your method, you just kind of stick with it. Right. Absolutely. You know, I, somebody, somebody from, uh, uh, we're a pretty global podcast and somebody from another country is probably going to shoot me for this one, but I actually do prefer, uh, Fahrenheit over centigrade. Mm-hmm. I feel like as a measure, right. Fahrenheit, because it has, uh, it's, uh, um, just the way it's done. I feel like I can actually have a more dialed temperature because the measures are closer together than like if you go to a tenth of a centigrade. Mm-hmm. Um, it's uh, it just like you, there are multiple points of Fahrenheit between a single tenth of a centigrade, and so I feel like it's actually more accurate. Mm-hmm. Um, I, but uh, then somebody's gonna give me a scathing email for that. But <laughs> the point is, one imperial thing I love is I do I, actually you know, really I, like. As, as I say, I like my 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 family will be like, "Oh, how hot is it over there today?" And I'll be like, "Oh, it's seventy five degrees." And they forget that I'm talking Fahrenheit, and so they think we're all just burning to a crisp here. Where I was like, "Oh, seventy five is gorgeous," and I think that's about <laughs> I don't know. 30 or something over there which you know is is a heat wave in the uk yeah a 75 uh c would be uh 130 (laughs) (laughs) i I mean that's probably wrong but it it would definitely be really really hot (laughs) one of the the reasons i liked your show and i really dove into it was that it is a homebrew cop podcast you guys talk about beers that you make you analyze the beers that you make and why you did them but but it also kind of pulls in that kind of pop culture podcast aspect to it, mm-hmm. and I feel like that uh, it's really a, a cool take on a on a at least on a homebrewing podcast. Um, you know, what what would you say is kind of the 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 coolest beer that you made so far throughout this kind of podcasting journey that you've had? Oh, that that that's really hard. Um, that 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 is really hard because I'm 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 such the proud parent. I love them all. Um, I mean, I think for me personally, I, I think my favorite beer, which was was kind of a cheat, it was actually from the Hitchhiker's Guide episode, is an Earl Grey lemon wheat beer. And I was making that before I had the idea of the podcast. And it just really fit with the theme of the book um, or the, one of the characters of the book. So I got really excited about that. But that is um, the reason I'm excited about that beer is it really was the first beer where it was my recipe. I did probably six different batches of it before I really got it to where I wanted it. Um, I mean, really, the, the last couple of batches for the first four, I was using one type of yeast and then I changed the yeast and it suddenly became much better. And so that that's the beer I'm personally most proud of. Um, I don't, I, I mean, obviously I can't speak for Tyler, but I can tell you um, two of my favorite beers he's made for the podcast was um, The Weekend at Bernie's Mai Tai, which was absolutely knockout. And that was a really fun brew day, which we talk about in the episode. And then his grapefruit blonde, which we were drinking this weekend, is just amazing. That's awesome. Where is the best place to find your show? The best place to find the show is so we're like many people, we're hosted by Anchor, but you can find us in iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Swoot, basically anywhere where you get your podcasts. We're generally there. 
And, and do you guys have a website or just uh, on the podcast? We we don't have a we don't have a website, but um, you can uh, find us on Twitter uh, at at Pop Culture Brews, um, and that's also our handle on Instagram. And people can email us at um, popculturebrews at gmail dot com. Awesome. Well, Andrew, thank you so much for uh, coming on our show and no, uh, really kind of talking about uh, all the cool stuff you guys are doing over there. Maybe you'll have me on your show and uh, I could br- have a brew day with you. That, that <laughs> would be great because I know you're, you're pretty close to us. So yeah, find, find a movie that you want to do. And I, uh, yeah, I, we'll, we'll get a brew together. You, you got it. You got it. Awesome. Well, well thanks. Absolutely. Thank you. I'd like to thank Andrew for taking the time to be on this week's show. If you'd like to check out his podcast, look in the show notes of this episode at homebrewingdiy.beer. I'll have a link to his podcast. You can also find us on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Just look for the handle at homebrewingdiy, all one word. Well, that's it for this week, and we'll see you next week on Homebrewing DIY.